All righty, we're, we're kicking off here again for the final session today. Thank you for staying with us. And, and for me, actually, this next session is really exciting because it highlights a lot of the uh, context and challenges and huge scope of work that creative technologists are tasked with. And really, we'll look at what that work has materialized as in two specific alumni practices that demonstrate from, a, from different angles uh, a lot of the questions that we were raising in the, the first panel and in the keynote. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to introduce first Sho Rust. Sho is a graduate of our graphic design program and uh, founder of Sho AI. Uh, prior to that, and he'll, he'll tell you quite a bit about Show AI and, and the work that he's doing with artificial intelligence and, and branding. But prior to that, he uh, worked for Boston Consulting Group Digital Ventures, was a, a lead technical designer, which is a title awfully close to creative technologist and I think um, really represents a lot of what people expect in that role. Uh, and also faculty here at Art Center. So Show and his co-founder, uh, Thomas, um, are, are teaching and, and bringing this live to our students. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Sho. Sho's got some slides to share and he'll give you a, a deeper look at where I, AI is living in his practice. Thank you, Sho. Hello, hello. I'm super excited to share with you the, uh, the art of AI. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to integrate AI in your everyday creative workflow. Um, all the images that you'll see throughout the slideshow, except the obvious ones, uh, were created with AI. I did it over the weekend, did it really quick. And then so you can as well. And you could do, we'll talk about doing a lot of other things too. Uh, you'll notice throughout the presentation, I have some notes down there, which is actually the, the prompt or the human command to the AI to generate the image that you see on the screen. So I started the company uh, with this belief that AI can bring beauty and clarity to the, to the world and the creative process. And then by clarity, I mean kind of being this nurturing guide. And by beauty, I mean it'll help you take bold action. So this is uh, Genie's kind of out of the bottle. Um, you've probably seen that AI is everywhere, and then especially in the news right now. Um, Google is doing some amazing stuff. Facebook is doing some amazing stuff. As Robbie mentioned, in 2014, I was at BCG, uh, where I was working with the top uh, businesses out there, where 94% of them are integrating AI in some way. It helps them kind of go through all that amazing data and then make it actionable for better customer experiences. Uh, soon afterwards, OpenAI was founded. And then that was a, that was a big deal, because I was a little bit worried that AI would be segmented to these big tech companies only. And these small, medium-sized businesses and entrepreneurs would just have a really hard time competing. Once OpenAI came out and I noticed, hey, um, there's an opportunity here. So I went ahead and started my company four years ago. Um, to really integrate AI into the workflow that I had, which is building ventures from scratch. So it's really exciting times. Soon afterwards, Stability, Midjourney, all these amazing uh, companies also came to fruition. Stability is worth noting too, because they've open sourced their code. And so you can actually create your own models, which is really cool. Uh, this graph is not fake. It's based upon the number of research papers on AI. And then so you can see it's exponential, and that's why you're seeing so many amazing things coming out every single day in the world of AI. So <laughs> this uh, adorable picture of a turtle wearing uh, like a war costume in space, I generated this about four months ago. If you put the same command into this, uh, the model that's been developed now, you get this. It's a huge, huge difference here. Um, I think you can see that. Here we have an example of a logo. Hey, I need a logo. Talk to an AI, hey, I need a logo, just like a designer, right? Tiny prompt. I don't think any designer here at Art Center would accept a job with a prompt that small, but now you got that. So 
these prompts that you just saw, they're kind of like magic spells, like uh, uh, waving a wand or something like that. Um, and then essentially, this is not a perfect framework, but it can help you get started if you start integrating and using AI in your workflow. So you start with the subject. I need a photograph. I need a painting. Um, I need a sculpture. You can actually do 3D audio code. Uh, the world is really expanding here, but that's, a, that's the art form. Then you have the subject. Um, you can actually fine tune models to have your product inside the model itself. So you can say, hey, I want to see my puppy in, uh, in space or something like that too. But, or your car or uh, your new uh, phone design. Then you have things like style. Um, a lot of people put artists in there, and that's a little controversial. We'll talk about that. Um, but style is things that you learn in like art history class, like the Bauhaus movement or Art Deco and stuff like that. And essentially, these little attributes help you kind of refine what the art looks like. You also add detail. So the more detail that you add, the better. Uh, you could talk about, hey, I want a blue ocean or a purple ocean. I want uh, a really robust, powerful looking spaceship. Wh however way you want to kind of describe your imagination or your vision or your dream using language, which is a very powerful tool. And ironically, people were scared about language and uh, the written word and stuff like that as well, saying that, oh, people won't have to think anymore. Um, AI is kind of the same scare, but we'll talk about that too. And then all these systems also have parameters, uh, which are like essentially little knobs. And so if you think about when you talk to a designer and say, or a photographer and say, hey, I want it really big, or I want the aspect ratio to be 16 by nine, those are little parameters that you can control depending on what system you're using. Then uh, obviously you can create your own systems where, where you have your own parameters. So as an artist, you can kind of create your own tool. So what is AI? <laughs> is it cute? It could be scary, it can be complex and do these detailed things. Um, can it do like logos and stuff like that? Simple, iconic. Um, can it be captivating? Can it tell a story? Can it be kind of crafty? You kind of see some of this stuff. None of this stuff is really art center level, but remember the progression be between today and four months ago. Um, if you had a teammate or a junior designer on your team and they went from, they made that kind of level of progression, that'd be pretty impressive. Or if you took a term and then uh, at the end of the term, you made that progression, as a faculty member, we'd be pretty impressed. But here we go. Uh, UI, can it tell kind of organized data, kind of direct people towards a goal? Um, keep in mind, it's not really good at text yet, <laughs> but we'll talk, there's some limitations that I'll get over very soon. Um, inspirational, fast, uh, there's probably some transportation designers that are cringing right now, but this could be a great brainstorming or mood boarding tool. Uh, I, I wanted to include this because my CDO at our AI company is uh, also an Center alum, and he used to work at Nike. Um, Nike is actually utilizing custom-made AI tools right now to explore new sneaker designs and iterate and innovate faster than ever. It's really exciting for them. And then, uh, so big question is, is it good? And then to kind of dissect that a little bit, let's, let's ask the reverse question. Is AI bad? <laughs> So this image right here that we saw um, was created with a few of these different attributes in the prompt. So you had uh, this artist named Michelangelo. I'm not going to butcher the last name. Uh, you had vintage sci-fi covers, and you had manga. And then patterns within each one of those kind of, think about it when you go into a search engine like Google, we're doing the opposite. We're taking all the patterns of those different styles and creating that artwork there. Um, if you look at any one of these individual attributes, you probably won't be able to find artwork that looks like that. So the good question is, is this copying or stealing? Uh, that's a question for you guys. Um, but it made me, it reminded me of a quote by actually like Steve Jobs. And it turns out he stole it from Pablo Picasso, who probably stole it from somebody else. <laughs> the quote says, good artists copy and then great artists steal. And then you can actually see that in some of the great artists that we know today. So here we have Steve Jobs, you have the Google founders, and then you obviously have George Lucas and Star Wars. So Steve Jobs wasn't the first person to come up with the iPad tablet. Um, Google wasn't the first search engine. I think we all remember Yahoo. And then probably something before that. And then George Lucas, Star Wars, the story of um, battling good and evil, light versus dark, it's been told before, 
but they added their own little twist to it. So <laughs> that's a picture of me over there, but it's actually not a picture of me. It's completely AI generated. And then so the really cool part is like, how do you put your own identity, your own voice, your own creativity in the AI itself? And you can actually do that with something called a fine tune model. So the image, the prompt is exactly the same for this, kind of a cyberpunk man. Uh, the one on the left was created with general AI. The one on the right, however, was created with a fine tune model trained on just a few images of myself. And then these are, the funny part with these images is that I wasn't looking like that at all. I was smiling, I was taking us, these are like little cell phone selfie images. And while smiling, I was typically leaned up against somebody else. But the AI was smart enough and was able to train itself on kind of my body structure, redo the lighting, kind of recreate that image right there. And then this is not just for imagery. Imagery is a great way to kind of like describe how the AI sees the world. But this is true for text, code, video, animation, audio as well. We're seeing this kind of AI progression and creation and generation capability across almost all industries. The one on the left here, oh, sorry, this is the same prompt for both, right? So let me set the stage there. Who are you? The AI on the left is a general AI. Every time you ask it, it'll tell you something completely different. In this case, it said that, hey, I'm a 20-year-old student at the University of Utah. You ask it again, it'll give you a completely different answer. This is a general AI. It's kind of not fine-tuned. The one on the right is actually the, um, the AI that our company uh, AI generates. Um, and so we custom fine-tune AI models for different businesses, companies, individuals, and different things like that. And then essentially, it knows who we are, what we do, who our audience is, our customers. And it's able to answer that very simple prompt with a detailed explanation. So the way that we do that is that um, I'm kind of a, I was, my title was like lean brand technical designer, right, at BCG. Um, but essentially, I was creating a bunch of design systems and style guides. And then so in a similar way, we kind of try to understand when we onboard a new customer, what their brand DNA is, what is their essence, who, who are they, what is their identity? And then we try to instill that in the AI. Our system handles things like the guidelines, handles things like the assets, and integrates across all touch points. And essentially, what that allows us to do is have the AI have senses into the system. And just like a good brand strategist or a designer, it knows what's going on. Uh, you can give it a simple prompt, and then it'll be able to understand context. So this is an AI basically trained on human intent. One other thing that's really important is a feedback loop too. So our guidelines and different things like that have CMSs and capabilities for the humans to update it, um, which is really, really important. The feedback loop is critical because AI with human is more powerful than AI alone. And then Google DeepMind actually proved that because uh, with chess, uh, an AI combined with a human was out be able to outwit an AI by itself. So here's another example of one of our customers. This is Swipes on their payments company. Write a sales email, create a joke, like um, create a campaign, create a blog. It's able to create contextually aware answers. And then it could do things where maybe your team isn't able to do it. It's able to take your origin story, your values, your DNA, and even do things like translate to different countries, different audiences at a click of a button, instantaneously. And this doesn't mean that humans should be completely removed from the situation. Uh, like, there's a lot of people out there that can craft better stories and written word than this, or have little human uh, relationships that they're able to integrate into the story. Um, but it's a really powerful way to kind of ideate faster and innovate and not look at a blank canvas. You also, as a CEO, I get a lot of questions about um, from different people on my team about what, what we do, who our ideal customer is. And then this alleviates me from a lot of answers, which is great. Uh, this is just a quick uh, testimony from one of our customers. The reason why I bring it up is because he mentions the benefit of AI for him. It allows him to essentially be more human by removing the robotic tasks and allow them to get back to what they'd love to do. Less time pixel pushing. Unfortunately, after I graduated, I spent a lot of time pixel pushing, and it's probably one of the pain points that drove me to start this business today. And that brand system on the right is completely generated by, without a designer or developer involved. Um, of course, the designers go in there afterwards and kind of make it their own, 
but you don't have to start from scratch anymore. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can focus on the story, what makes you different, and how you differentiate in the market. So we see this as an inevitable thing. Um, I think we all do at this point. AI is really based upon a progression in large data sets and computing power. Um, and then we've seen, oh, there's a sound. OK, we're back. Uh, we've seen this in other industries already. So if you take a look at even things like web development, um, when I first came to Art Center as a young student, uh, I was still working like text editors. Now we have content management, and then we went into frameworks, and then we have really complex design systems. And then now anybody without some of the background can launch an e-commerce website with things like Shopify. Things are getting more and more intelligent. Obviously, Shopify is integrating AI. And we see the same thing happening in brand identity. And that's what we're focused on, essentially empowering more entrepreneurs, more creatives with superhuman precision and speed so they can focus on how to differentiate and compete against big tech companies that have that same advantage. So where does that leave hum humans? Well, I'm really excited, and I'm glad Brian said the same thing earlier, because it essentially allows us to focus on things that make us human. A lot of the things that AI is really good at is a kind of repetitive grunt tasks or things that have already kind of been discovered before. It kind of leaves humans to be able to do a lot more discovery, uh, build relationships with customers, develop more human insight, make those connections that we never really had the time to do before because we were so overwhelmed by what the market expected from us. So I kind of uh, decided to ask AI this question, I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, I'll just ask the AI. And it gave me a little bit of a cliche answer. And then so I'll try to enrich the AI by partnering with it um, and giving you some more background behind these answers or these bullets. So I asked it, what should students do to adapt in the age of AI? It came back with three considerations. One, stay up to date, right? I think we all kind of get that. Um, but in the AI world, it's really important because progression is happening so quickly. The other one is being able to work together as a team. So as, as tasks kind of move away from these te technical repetitive tasks, to be e economically viable with your creative work, you need to be really able to do the things that humans are really good at. Build relationships with your team. Get everybody in the same community kind of pedaling in the same direction. Having a vision. Having an imagination being able to daydream a little bit. The sketchbook work and a lot of the work that we do here at Art Center is fantastic for this. You also need to be able to communicate very clearly and effectively. And that's partially the reason why I'm here today. <laughs> I'm practicing. Um, so with that said, uh, our, our vision is that we really want every creator, large or small, to have the opportunity to clearly create, communicate, and share their identity with the world. Welcome to the new world of AI. Excited to see what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Sho. Uh, and, and next, we will introduce uh, Adit uh, Danush Kodi. I think I pronounced that right. A graduate of our MDP program. And Adit has worked as a techno creative technologist uh, in a, a range of capacities since graduating from Art Center, and uh, also has a background as an engineer uh, and has worked in industry in a variety of capacities. So uh, my hope is that Adit will, will show uh, a wider context of the type of creative technology work that he's done across different projects, and then we'll, we'll gather together at the end for a brief uh, conversation about this work uh, between show and audit. So thank you, audit. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is audit. I'm from the uh, an alum from the MDP program. And I'm currently working as a creative technologist at uh, moving brands I'm at, in their labs team, uh, working with another uh, whole team of developers, designers and other creative technologists to research build and imagine new immersive and interactive experiences for various clients. Uh, this talk is a bit of a reflection of my creative technology practice um, and what my work as a creative technologist looks like at maybe a more granular level. 
and it'll include a blend of my work both at uh with the labs team as well as work from my personal practice um so to start i'll share how i ended up being a creative technologist because this wasn't really a position that was on my radar when i first got it when i first got started um i have a background in engineering and these are some pictures from that time uh studying mechanical engineering but while i was there i also had a very creative practice um to the point, and I was practicing a lot of design skills, to the point where after graduation, I started working as a product designer. But I always felt like this engineering side of my brain was different than the design side of my brain. It would be like one side of my brain would create designs, and then the other one would hand it, it, would hand it off to my engineering side, who would then execute on the designs. So as I searched for what a design and making practice would look like, creative technology is kind of what I found. And I think there's still a lot of definitions of creative technology, but for me, it's I still see it as primarily a design practice that treats technology as material. And so I'll explain further. Um, the first kind of category of my work that I've done as a creative technologist is uh, building to learn or thinking by making. And so this category kind of contains, for me, the key distinction between some of the engineering making style work that I did and uh, the creative technology work that I do now. In a creative technology practice, you let the making and the prototyping inform the design by treating technology as a material that you're working with. So what does that mean? Um, you're treating it as a, as a material that can be manipulated, whose affordances could be understood. And so this is a screenshot from some of my work when I was doing a lot of work with machine learning. And here I was writing a, um, my own little very simple neural network as a way to understand the basics of AI, to understand how you could manipulate how AI works um, and so that I could develop an intuition for it. And I think that's key to a lot of this build to learn type work. You have to develop an intuition for the technology just like you develop an intuition for any other kind of material. Um, and to show an example of how I kind of build that, I'll switch to a more tactile technology that I've been exploring for the past couple of years. So I've spent, oh, so I've spent the last three years learning how to sew very slowly, kind of just on the side for fun. And I'm trying to develop that kind of material intuition for this technology. My goal isn't necessarily to become the best or have my craft to be very amazing, but it's for me to be able to think of an idea and then to be able to think of that idea through the material, um, just like I can do with a lot of machine learning now. And so the way that I normally start with this process is by taking on little projects. And so all this stuff is just random things I've made. And it doesn't matter how hard the tutorial is, as long as I'm actually interested and invested in the project, I'll have the patience that's needed. And along this process, uh, there's a lot of just repetition and patience, the number of variations of the exact same thing that I've made, retrying different things, seeing, uh, building that intuition, and the number of times I've torn apart stitches, sewn things back together. And then naturally, there's also a lot of failure. Uh, this is a shirt that looks like it should fit, um, but then when I try to put it on, it feels like a straight jacket. And so the key part of this whole process of building that intuition is then reflection and understanding what, why this is why I failed. And in this case, it was understanding the property choices of the fabric that I was using. And so to bring it back to kind of more digital technology, I've been spending a lot more time uh, in XR spaces and building an intuition for XR. And this isn't just all just staring at code, though a lot of the time it is. I've spent just days of debugging things, um, but it's also playing games in VR, um, meeting people, um, yeah, building things and failing. Um, but all of this is to build that material intuition so that when the time comes that you get a new opportunity space or a brief, you then can let that intuition start to uh, inform your design and you're designing through that making process. The next part of my practice, I would say, is making ideas tangible. Uh, and so I think to bring this back to design, to a design practice, uh, I think core to any design practice is storytelling. And so this is a project that I did last year, recognizing the 150th anniversary of the Chinese massacre of 1871 here in LA, um, where I used newspaper archives 
from the 1860s to tell the story of the horrific event and the anti-Chinese sentiment that fueled it. And I think that even though there's not that much digital technology here, I think that this same thread of storytelling becomes really important in a creative technology practice. Um, and so that thread of storytelling becomes really important even as you bring that digital, digital technology in. And so this is a project I did a while back where we, we were creating an early prototype of a hydroponic system as we were researching the future of food systems and climate change. And this is just an early prototype. It was just for our team, but it helps us feel the tangibility of the concept. And along the way, we're still telling a story. The components that we use, the way everything is assembled, it all is used to tell a story about the context in which you might find this thing. And then it lets us also, the tangibility of it lets us interrogate the idea and push it forward to the most interesting aspects. And I think also in my practice, prototypes take the place of sketches. I'm not great at sketching, but I can bring, make things quickly. And so I treat quick, quick prototypes as quick sketches. They don't, I don't try to be too precious about it. They don't have to look great. They can be super rough, but just getting them out into the world is super valuable. And the key thing is like any storytelling approach is understanding the audience. Who is this prototype for? What do you intend to use it for? And that starts to tell you the fidelity of the prototype. It can, can it be a cardboard prototype? Can it be a video? Does it have to be interactive? What's the best way to communicate that idea? Um, as an example, um, this is a quick sketch that I made of a VR phone controller idea I had maybe a month back. And in the prototype above, I was just mirroring my phone orientation to a 3D model in the browser. And of course, my concept was way more complicated than this. I had all sorts of ideas. But just the act of making this simple thing and then showing it to my coworkers, I got 10, 20 different ideas of different directions I could go in. Um, and so just making that idea quickly and tangible really improves those kinds of conversations. Uh, and then the final category of work is blending two kind of categories, which I've labeled navigating systems and building tools. Um, so I think common to any kind of design practice is understanding uh, and making sense of systems. And so these are all various maps that I've made. Uh, there's practical workflow diagrams, there's technical diagrams, kind of illustrating flow of inputs and outputs and algorithms. There's more metaphorical diagrams. And I think as a creative technologist, this understanding of a system uh, I use as a map. And it helps you not only find new design opportunities, but also opportunities to build tools to fill gaps in implementation. So I'll give an example. Uh, this is some ongoing work that we're doing at Moving Labs, uh, designing and building a digital experience for the Spacesuit Art Foundation. Um, we're scanning this spacesuit, uh, which is a collage, which is made of a collage of artworks from children all across the globe and turning it into the centerpiece of a digital experience where kids can explore that same spacesuit and the artwork and see where it's from. And so as we were doing the initial kind of design and prototyping, we knew that we'd have to map the 2D artwork images that you can see in the app to the actual spacesuit model. And so based on my understanding of the initial design intent, as well as the basic technical system, um, I, was working, I worked with our 3D developer to get a workflow set up where we could tag artworks with 3D positions. And then I built a tagging tool on the right um, and to filter and identify artworks. And then as we were doing this work, it started to inform the design too. We started to notice, oh, hey, the, the scanning, the photogrammetry process created a lot of blurry artwork on the spacesuit. So we're going to have to adjust the design and create a fallback. And so there's this back and forth between kind of designed and implementation. And as a creative technologist, you're kind of sitting right at the middle of it. Uh, another example of how you can start to build tools to fill those gaps is in this feature in the application uh, to view uh, a data visualization of climate data on top of the globe part of that. And so to design this feature, we need to understand what kind of data do we have available, um, what format is it in, um, as well as a lot of the normal design stuff of who the audience is and how we want to display information to them. So here I had to do a bunch of work. First, you have to programmatically uh, to understand, you have to understand the API, there's APIs that are available and programmatically access the NASA data sets. Then you need to go back to the designers and technologists 
and uh, make sense of that output and see how we might incorporate that into the design. And once you have more of that understanding of the design intent, you then go back into code and you go into Python and you start to, how do you turn this data set into the data set that you need to actually make this thing real? And then finally, you work, work with other people to maybe upload this into the CMS so that the developers can use it while developing the application. And so I see all of this as, again, being in that middle point between kind of the creative and, uh, and the development and implementation side. Um, and then finally, I guess there's even simple things like we needed all these stylized art borders in this application. Um, and there's many, many countries in the app, so it would take a long time to make them by hand. And so um, I made a quick Figma plugin that would take World Bank country, country border data and turn that into the right stylized border um, with some options for me to adjust. And I get to make those kind of decisions as I'm building it. And so that's kind of three ways that I see my work right now as a creative technologist. I think it's always evolving um, as I continue to do more work. But uh, I'm excited to continue the dialogue about what creative technology practice looks like. Thanks. Thank you, Audit. And Sho, why don't you join us up front? I think, I, are, we, are we on? I think we're good, great. Oh, there's a switch, okay. Hello? Testing, there we go. Great. Yeah. So, a lot to digest in, in both of your presentations and um, I think coming into this conversation from slightly different angles. But one thing that I, I think r really resonates is your approach to introducing these types of practices or these types of workflows or types of new technology enabled opportunities. How have you found your role as a kind of facilitator and um, maybe person that's tasked with introducing a group to a new way of working or a new way of thinking? It's, it's tricky, um, especially uh, these days, people are a little bit more open to AI, but just over a year ago, um, people were pretty skeptical about how AI can help in the creative workflow. So when we told them that, hey, you can integrate AI in your brand building process, and it can, it can actually help you, um, there was a lot of education that needed to take place. And I can imagine for yourself too, like uh, getting coworkers to buy into the idea that, hey, I'm gonna spend time researching this, and then being okay with, you know, when you're developing technology like this, there's, you have to fail to innovate. Um, and then some people don't have the stomach for it. And so it is a, it is a bit of a roller coaster. It's you continuously have to kind of push your team to kind of reach for the next frontier, the next, uh, the next way that we can say, Hey, this is an obstacle, but we can push past this. Yeah. I think one approach that I've had is, uh, showing, not telling. I think yeah. often just finding enough space for myself, enough time to to show, to make a thing, to then show that to a person. Um, because I think, yeah, just from, especially from my experience, just doing design work, showing a thing, making a prototype, it is so much more compelling and it clicks in people's brains in a way that just seeing a sketch or seeing like yeah, seeing something d doesn't always connect. So I try to find those kinds of opportunities. And then it's like, yeah, cultivating that. You build trust with people. Um, you show them one thing and then you say, I can do more of this. And you buy yourself more and more time um, so that people can start to trust in that vision. But it is definitely challenging to yeah find that time initially. Um, what are some of those initial responses that, that might be... Um, perceived as roadblocks or um, when people don't quite want to come on board, even if you, even after you've taken that risk and, and put, sort of put yourself out there in a vulnerable way, mm -hmm. what happens when it, it doesn't quite land? How do you kind of continue back to the, 
to the drawing board? Uh, I mean, I think you find different, I, I think a lot of the time it's about communication, right? And so you have to figure out how to speak their language in whatever context you're in. And so, um, yeah, it, I just usually take it as like a, almost like a critique, a bad a critique. Somebody's coming at you with a certain perspective and then you figure out a different way to take that into account and then you reformulate it and come back. You don't take that necessarily as a no, but as a way to figure out how do I tell this story in the right way about this practice and its value um, and find a different way to bring it in. Um. Yeah, I, I ran into the same problem. And then essentially for me, asking, hey, what are the pain points that we're trying to solve here, either for my employees or for the customers, and say, hey, this here's a user journey where that pain is not as bad. Here's, <laughs> here's some pain pills. <laughs> and then really focusing on the benefit for their current circumstance. Because our software can do so much it's really easy to just overwhelm people. And then they don't really fully understand how to like contextualize or integrate what you're talking about into their lives. But saying, hey, what's your, what's your problem? Like listening first and then responding with a solution to whatever they're dealing with at that moment makes it really real and memorable. Well, and, and very much in, in line with how you've sh shown the development of AI enabled technology, the, um, the initial result isn't necessarily where the 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 capacity or the the possibilities lie so so how have you worked in that way to kind of control and contain some of what those possibilities are when when you enter into these environments collaborative or otherwise yeah the the, the first results are always really bad right like one of the things that we're working on right now we create some imagery and different things like that uh, for our system, but logos are tricky, especially like the type within them and stuff like that to get AI to create quality logos. And then at the very beginning, uh, it was really bad, but as we keep iterating on different models and more and more data sets, um, it, it gets a lot more prog progressively convincing for even like internal team members. So we, we had this conversation uh, even internally where we're like, I don't know if like for this type of brand messaging, our AI is very good. And then, oh, hold on, hold on. We're very early in this problem solving. And we haven't even really closely taken a look at the data and what's causing it to be bad. But kind of following and reverse engineering some of those outputs is a great way to go. Uh, for me, it's maybe not being technology first. Like maybe technology is there, but being more important is what, what's, what kind of outcome are you looking for? What's the story you're trying to tell? Um, and the technology doesn't need to be upfront always in that story. Uh, the technology might enable the thing to happen, mm -hmm. but it can be in the background. It doesn't need to be the, the main character in the story, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, and, and uh, uh, kind of as you're seeing your next, the next phase of your work evolve, how does the recent couple of years and, and watching the pace of change in your own work with the tools that are maybe three or four years ago, not super accessible, now being sort of button click. Um, how do you see that changing where you spend your time learning, where you spend your time investigating? Maybe show you could start with sure. something that you shared about going back to history, back to philosophy, back to literature. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um you know, it, it's funny. I've even used our AI as like a therapist last year <laughs> to like solve some of my own problems. And then it's it's interesting how it's continuously being able to evolve as a tool for different means. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I completely forgot the question. <laughs> oh, well, well just, I guess it's yeah. it, 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 what's what's clear is that the accessibility to these tools and the incorporation of AI or um, mm. algorithmic process or ability to process massive data sets has become much more accessible. Yes. Does, does that change how you think about your, where you're looking in terms of developing your expertise, expanding your own design and, and creative uh, approach? Yeah, the, the tech part, we're starting to figure out, okay, the tech part's starting to work. Now, how do I fit this puzzle piece in humanity? Um, how do I really benefit the customer? So I'm spending a lot more time understanding the customer, what their needs are, so I can fit this piece of technology perfectly in there. A big part of that is kind of me maturing as a leader and uh, maturing my understanding of the market 
and the customers instead of just like focusing. I think the first two years I was really focused on the technology because it needed to get to a place where it was it did have benefit, um, it did have a utility. Um, but yeah, it's it's ex exciting shift. I, I find myself spending a lot more time on Zoom uh, talking to customers than I do in code or design programs now. Uh, and I think for me, I think I still. I still maintain a little bit of that. I want to go under the hood and really understand what some of these one-click applications are doing. Um, but the the availability of those tools makes prototyping so much faster, especially if you have that that kind of material intuition for the technology at its core, right? But I think that sometimes the one-clickness of everything can make it so that you can use this tool without really understanding what what the technology is actually doing. And that might be okay for some applications, but for me as a creative technologist, I feel like I'm supposed to, I want to understand that, that base layer so that I can, because that's kind of where I almost find a lot of my design inspiration. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, trying to understand the ways in which it works under the hood a little bit, even though I might still use the, the, the simplified tools. I'm not going to just go and write some low level in low lang low level coding language or something like that. But to understand I, that it's still useful. I completely agree. Like, I think I learned so much from like just watching tutorials on lynda.com. Shout out to Linda. <laughs> but like learning how to use a tool just really unlocks so, so much. Cause like someone created that feature for a reason. And so it's, it's solving something. So I love that. Well, and, and something I respect about both of your work so much is the commitment to get going deep and, and knowing the, the full stack of tool tools that you're bringing into your your work into what you deliver and um i think that that balance is sometimes hard for people because you know you you both have somewhat of an engineering background competency in uh you know a, a wide array of approaches um how how can we all learn from that like what are some of the less about the the detailed technologies or the particular application, but what are some of the ways in, in the day-to-day -day life that you, you might dive into something new and start to noodle around in it? I, I just get naturally curious. So I probably spent the weekend just reading like research papers on AI. And then after, after I start reading, I just, it's like the curiosity drives me. And so kind of when it comes to these tech um, platforms and trying to get under the hood, I'd really kind of uh, gravitate towards ones that just generally, genuinely interest you. And then, so it's easy to do that deep dive. Um, it's almost like an obsession for me at this point. And then, uh, but finding that thing that you are kind of obsessed about, uh, makes it a lot easier. O otherwise that's a, that's a brutal task. I, I don't think there's not that many people out there that want to deep dive into research papers on their weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me also it's curiosity. It's like really curiosity led. Um, play, I think, is a big thing also, especially when you're learning. Uh, just having fun with the thing, and th that's what for me. It's like very project based. If someone's like to learn how to code, uh, there's lots of to do list apps on and tutorials on making those, and I can never get past those because to me, making a to do list app is so boring. But coming up with some idea that I have and then piecing together, grabbing something from this tutorial and that tutorial to make my vision a reality um, is way much, is so much more fun than just following a tutorial that I have no interest in following. Um, and so, yeah, coming up with little fun projects to, to learn. And like, yeah, I might throw it away at the end of the day, but it was still like that learning process is just that repetition of making fun things until you start to build that, that competen competency in the skills. And and to to bridge on that back to the the professional realm and uh, and this will be my last question before maybe there's if there are questions in the audience um, when you're in that exploratory playful learning space and and you might be tasked with coming up with a certain plan or a particular spec or a particular result what what do you where do you kind of move into the into a sort of a more determinist sort of scope scope of work spec sheet type of approach how does how does that bridge work for you 
So th this is something I'm really bad at. I like the really <laughs> exploratory. That's why I like working a lot more in the exploratory, like fr front half of, of, of work because it's very open-ended. Um, I think at some point you do start to like piece together a plan. Um, usually there's some bounded brief with the, with something at the end and you give yourself time boxes. You're like, okay, two weeks to just really explore. And then at this time I have to start doing these things. And so you start kind of piecing together a plan, but, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily one of my strengths. And so I think p part of that for me has also been trying to find the right role in a place where I'm not forced to be making plans all the time. And there's other people who have to wrangle me and make plans around, around me a little bit. So, um, there are lots of people who are really good at that, but I know that I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm exactly the same way. I, I'm lucky. Uh, I've I've hired amazing teammates, and they do incredible work. And then there's a lot of my teammates that are good at it. And then so I team up with them. I kind of look at ourselves as we each have our individual superpower, and then uh, we make that happen. But I I'm definitely kind of a chaotic builder. Um, I can get lost into things, so it's very helpful to have people on my team that say, "Hey, you know, this needs to happen at this time, or we need to focus on this." Um, yeah, it's 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 great having that team. When and that team is is by design, I, you know. Being, I think what I'm what I'm hearing and and um, something that is through all of this work is an ability to reflect on your own role within these complex multi-layered, multi, multi-tier processes of making something new that might not be limited to one person or one experience, but th require a, a kind of a, a, a fabric and a community and um, a, a, a kind of a wider array of, of uh, people involved. And um, that, that ability to, to, be multiple types of creatives to be able to shift between those. I, 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 I think is something that we can all really learn from and certainly in, in jobs that are not creative at all and, and how to kind of, um, how to, how to manage the, the, the array of tools, the, um, great unknowns of the professional world and, and the context that we're working in. So yeah. I think, Maybe if there is a question in the audience, we we break for that. Uh, Max, I'm not sure if there's any questions from the um, chat. If there are, you can start with that. Yeah, I have a few questions, um, AI related questions from Zoom. Uh, first one being, um, Cho, you you talked about. Um, following and sort of reverse engineering outputs to to improve and to evolve uh, what the AI is actually able to offer. Um, Whitney is asking, what, what kinds of information do you actually use to be able to fine tune the AI for each specific brand? Uh, in, in order that it will be able to create answers that are both contextually aware and um, provide real value for the brand and um, how they're positioning themselves and um, the voice that they're giving to their... Uh, absolutely. So the big part is we have to understand the identity, the essence, the brand DNA of each individual customer or brand in this circumstance. So we have questions around their values, their, their benefits, um, what their product is, even their founding story. So we have a good idea of essentially like, it's almost like a personality test. <laughs> and then through that, we know how to basically take that personality and apply it to the AI itself. Now, beyond that, as you interact with our platform, um, and then as you add more assets or as you use it, uh, the AI is continuously learning from your behavior, which is another great way to kind of fix that alignment issue. It, it really is an alignment issue. Like imagine bringing on a new designer onto your team. You're trying to align them around the vision, the mission, what you're trying to do together as a team so you can paddle in the same direction. And it's essentially what we do during our kind of our onboarding process is collect that data, try to get all the data that we can as much as we can. Um, 
but it's actually pretty simple. At, at a minimum of 17 questions in 20, 20 minutes, uh, we can actually distill like typically generally who, who, what, where, what, how, you know, the, the general things about the business. Great. And then, um, Anne is wondering, uh, sort of from the legal perspective, how will copyright laws licensing, um, how will the sort of legal aspects that are continuing to, um, grow, evolve and adapt to technology? Uh, how do you see them adapting to AI creation, training data sets to, to your work at Shadai AI? And then, um, I'm not sure if there's any crossover with, uh, your work on it, but if, if there's, um, any way that your work sort of interacts with the rules around, um, sort of legal consequences and, and what you're, you're enabled to do and whether you see that as being further restricted in the future or not. Yeah. Um, for forgery is kind of not a new thing. There's been like artists out there that forger like Picasso's and different things like that. And det detecting them is pretty hard, but there's actually AI that can detect AI generated art and like even written language now with like really high accuracy. It's like 98% already. And then a lot of the big tech companies, they do, they do see this as an issue. I think even Adobe announced something very big around this as well, where you can kind of verify something as like human made or AI made. Um, in terms of like the legal ramifications of like generated art, um, typically I think like if you steal certain, steal, uh, certain styles and different things like that, and then make it your own in a certain way, by creating your own recipe. Um, I think that's okay. And that's not illegal. Uh, I think it becomes illegal when you say, Hey, I, Hey, create, like ask an AI, Hey, create a new Picasso drawing for me and then sign a Picasso and sell it to someone as a Picasso, because essentially what you're doing there is stealing someone's identity and then you're stealing their purpose and their mission in life. And that's a much more problematic situation. And I don't know if I have as much like I haven't dealt as much with any of the legal implications of a lot of the creative technology work, but I do know that in my own practice, that's super values driven thinking about a lot of these questions before engaging in any, in any kind of project and, um, including the team that we're working on at, at moving brands. And so, um, yeah, I think that the values that you're trying to instill and try and doing research on that before jumping headfirst into a technology is something that's happening at the same time as that kind of creative technology work. But um, yeah, I don't have anything too specific though. Yeah, those values, those questions that you asked at the very beginning, this is a lot of stuff that we do at Art Center, like that we taught to be doing at Art Center. So I think that's that, that human element. And then also that human intent too. Like if your intent is to steal someone's stuff, and not create your own work. I think that that's when it becomes problematic. I think that the legal system will have to update a little bit. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see how they adapt, but I think that that should happen in the legal system, not within big tech companies. I think it's a, some people think that, Hey, we shouldn't release this AI to the general population. I think that's probably a mistake. Cause then it's just like, uh, it's only going to be the tech companies that can create, you know, their own AI and like benefit from it. And then, entrepreneurs, startups, people with a vision of creating their own business, but don't have the resources and different things like that to compete in this new kind of, it's like trying to take a Honda to a formula one race. You mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. Um, but it's, I'm really excited to see how companies like stability are, uh, opening up code. So, so we can create new models and new ways of inter interfacing with it. That's great. And, uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions for show or audit, uh, feel free to walk right up to the microphone over here. And it's okay if there are no questions, oh, we, question. oh, we have, we have a question. Not so much a question, but a comment and a, and a, and a congratulations. Both of you guys focused on outcomes and starting with the customer or the user's needs and then working back to your technology. And that's not intuitive to technologists, creative or not. And so I just wanted to sort of pat you on the back for noticing that because ultimately when you're building something, 
you're trying to get the world to pay attention to it, you have to do exactly what you described. So I wanted to emphasize that and make sure everybody in Radio Land was hearing that and embracing that idea because that's that's how you succeed. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we would say that AI is like twenty percent of our business. I'd say like seventy percent is really understanding the customer, understanding their needs, um, making sure that what we do really benefits people in the right way. It's a, it's a long game for us. And then uh, we're very focused on what's best for humanity in this case. Um, and then I kind of spent some time kind of growing up, my family's in a small town and different things like that. I, I really see uh, AI as a way that we can help some of those small businesses um, stay and compete in this crazy trillion dollar marketplace and advertising and different things like that. Cause they can't create these co really compelling stories that are almost brainwashing the population right now. Um, so it's important that we also provide these tools to these entrepreneurs and these creatives so they can get their story heard. And from this, what seems like a growing barrier or a wall that these tech companies are building a moat. Yeah. Thank you. That, that that's why I think of creative technology as a design practice because I think design puts the people first and thinking about the yeah and so that's how I still see myself as a designer even though I'm bringing a lot of code and other kind of technology into my practice and then the, the AI too like even our AI we really go outside and really talk to experts as well uh, and say hey hey how does your process work? How can we help you make a bigger impact? So we have some great um, uh, brand strategists that are pretty famous that we go to and say, hey, you're trying to make a, the world a more beautiful place, um, but you're kind of limited in terms of how many people you can help. And through the AI, we can kind of take your guidelines, uh, take your wisdom, and then bring it to more people that couldn't afford your services before. So they can kind of help communicate their story uh, with clarity and beauty. Yeah, hopefully. I have another question from a uh, Zoom member. Um, they're wondering if there are any resources that you're aware of or used um, to, to be able to imagine this sort of work process and the, um, the, the positions that you're filling now. Um, we've talked about creative technologists as sort of this um, definition for yourself that could mean a lot of different things. Um, how can people who are thinking about being creative technologists think about um, what directions they can take their career in and how to make those things happen? I mean, for me, it's been just doing work regardless of the name to the title. Uh, this is the first job that I've had where I've actually been called a creative technologist. In my other roles, I've been a designer, but reflecting on that practice, I was doing things as a designer that maybe you might consider is the role of a creative technologist. And so I think in whatever space you're in, you can start to try to pull methods or bring technology into your practice in small ways to start to craft that role in whatever organization you're in. Because, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how many places you're going to be able to find that already has that spot open and is looking for people that fit that exact definition, especially when it's really hard. Like, like you mentioned, every definition is different. And so you can't just, when you search creative technologist on the internet and look for jobs, every job description is slightly different. And so it's, it is definitely tough to like find your way into that, the spot that aligns those your definition of how you see your practice and that spot. But. Yeah, I comp completely agree. Um, it's interesting, even uh, Brian Johnson, at the, the first keynote speaker, a lot of what he does, I think, is really exciting. And that's the kind of thinking that he gets to do, the dreaming, the uh, where he gets to imagine the future, kind of helps set the compass for the future. And I, I think that role will be always available. And then so, being really sensitive to the world around you, um, I think is pretty key. Like noticing little things um, that other people don't notice as opportunities to making the world a better place. Um, and that could be as simple as just like uh, making a conscious note of certain things that are happening 
in the world um, and saying, okay, this is an opportunity. Uh, I, can, I can do something here or I can set a compass so I can use a tool like AI or um, Photoshop or whatever you're using to kind of solve that problem. Um, yeah. Well, and it, it, in light of that, it would sort of in a imaginary far future world where everything is immediately possible and, and easy to render in real time with 300 DPI and 30 frames a second, it becomes then a really a, a matter of who, who has access and um, what, what story they might be telling about the incredibly highly rendered reality that might be possible. Absolutely. Like, what do you want to bring to fruition? Like, what questions do you has, have? I think in the future, everybody will have access to great AI, like great creation capabilities, great storytelling capabilities. But what story are you trying to tell? And being like very clear about that moving forward will position really well as an artist. Um, and the artists are like by nature really good at this. So I'm actually really excited for creatives and creators of the future because you put even tools like AI in the hands of someone that's not creative. Um, it's, it's, it kind of just produces noise. Um, but if you put it in the hands of someone that's already good, has a vision, um, is asking the right questions, they can be great. They can be iconic. They can be legendary. Yeah. I don't think I have anything, <laughs> anything to add. Well, brilliant. Well, I think we, we can wrap up there and um, we thank you for, for attending today. We've got a great uh, set of, of panels and presentations tomorrow that kicks off here at the Amundsen again at nine o'clock and uh, also streaming live for, for all of you in the audience um, online. And the conversation tomorrow will, will really take some of what we've been talking about today in practice here in, in, in this panel and continue to push that forward. So we'll be looking at advanced digital creation, uh, the various workflows and tool sets and um, types of approaches to image making and, and the way in which that is absolutely being influenced and um, um, kind of moved by creative technology. So, um, Stay tuned for that. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we'll, we'll conclude now. Thank you, everybody. And, and, a, and a, a thank you, Robbie. This is, this is awesome. You, yeah, to, to show an audit um, and, and for being open and vulnerable and sharing your work in, in this context. It, it means a lot to us. Uh, it's, it's so good to be back here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you for the invitation.